Um, hi, everyone. Thank you very much for taking time out of your day to day. And thank you to Paige and Dagan uh, and Kathy for organizing the, all the technical uh, details behind this series of webinars. This is really an exciting new project that we've launched. Um, we've been having in-person meetings for the past few years, every six months. And in our more recent meetings, we've been really tracking online um, attendees who dial in with the streaming services. And oftentimes the remote attendees are more than the in-person attendees. So this is our first time trying out a webinar format to try to put all of the information um, in a remote format. And we really look forward to hearing your uh, feedback at the survey that Paige mentioned at the end of the um, week. We'll be sending a new survey at the end of every week so you can give feedback on whatever webinars you attended. So um, I'll be talking today about what we've been doing for the past few years through the NASA Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences team. And there's so much to talk about. Of course, I can't cover it all in just 40 minutes. And that's why we have uh, about four weeks worth of webinars digging into specific issues. This morning, our program manager, John Haynes, gave a really nice overview of how the HACAST project fits into broader activities at NASA headquarters. And I'll be talking to you about what HACAST is, how it's worked, um, what makes it a little different than a traditional NASA research program, and giving some examples of um, the work that we've done, but also kind of the structures that have promoted those works and what works and what doesn't. So just to start out, um, I'll note that uh, we'll be using the term HACAST a lot uh, today and in future webinars. And if you haven't been familiar with the work of our team, I'd really encourage you to check out our website, which is HACAST.org, H-A-Q-A-S-T. And we are a mission-driven organization uh, funded by NASA to bring NASA science down to earth and deliver it into your hands. And when we say, you know, the hands of stakeholders, we are referring to any organization working in health or air quality who could benefit from using NASA data in a way they don't yet, or in new ways. They may already be a user, but could um, uh, adopt and benefit from NASA investments in new ways. So a lot of our work is trying to build the connections with new organizations and to uh, work with the partners who've already expressed interest in our work. So on our website, it talks about who we are, some of the projects, news, um, tools and resources, which is a great place to get started if you've never used NASA data before. And we've also archived um, material from all of our meetings, including the series of webinars. So when we think about what is HACAST, um, as you know, it is the Health and Air Quality Applied Sciences Team. This is a NASA-funded applied sciences team, which is to say that it is structured around individual grants. There are 13 grantees, um, and the PIs of each grant are referred to as our members. So we have 13 members, but each of the 13 grants has multiple co-investigators, graduate students, um, and others involved. So overall, we have well over 70 people in the HACAST community. When HACAST was announced in 2016, it was uh, envisioned as a three-year initiative. Uh, about a year ago, there was a lot of um, uh, positive uh, response from NASA about the work that we were doing, and they extended the whole HACAST project an additional year. So now it's been a four-year enterprise and it's running through this summer of 2020. Um, I'll note that uh, NASA has just released on um, the 14th a new solicitation for a new HACAST. So just like this team that I'll be describing to you was competed in 2016 and the 13 proposals were selected, that same process is going on this year in 2020. And that solicitation um, is online. And it was also something that John Haynes talked about in his presentation this morning. Um, so we have this mission of connecting NASA science with air quality and health applications. We are focused on health applications that pertain to air quality, 
um, although the broader um, activities of the health and air quality program at NASA do also tie into non-air related health um, uh, outcomes. The overall project budget has been about $15 million, which is divided across those 13 projects. And really there's three types of work that go into HACAST. One are the member projects, and these are what the 13 PIs and their co-investigators proposed when they submitted their proposal three and a half years ago. The second type of work are called tiger teams, and these are collaborative subgroups that formed through HACAST in response to the needs and requests of different stakeholder organizations. And I'll be talking to you more about how the tiger teams were set up and how they were selected. And the third type of work we do is outreach and engagement and trying to respond to requests that come in. Because what we found is that uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done around building relationships and sharing information and widening access to the work that we're doing to make sure that it's having the maximum impact. So I'll be talking about all of these over the next uh, few minutes. In terms of who's on the NASA team, the 13 PIs are listed here um, on the slide. Uh, I'm the team lead. Brian Duncan, who's our next uh, webinar speaker on Thursday, uh, is on the team. Arlene Fiore from Columbia University, Minghui Dao from San Jose State, Davin Henze at the University of Colorado, Jeremy Hess at the University of Washington, Yang Lu at Emory, Jessica Nu at NASA JPL, Susan O'Neill at the Forest Service, Ted Russell at Georgia Tech, uh, Dana Pong at George Mason University, and Jason West at um, Chapel Hill and Mark Zonlo at Princeton. So a wide range of institutions that are represented, but also a lot of different areas of expertise. And this is really one of the things that makes the team work so effectively, is that the team shares some common mission and some common um, overlapping tools but also is bringing, some folks are coming more from the health perspective, some are coming more from the satellite data analysis perspective, some from modeling and air quality and policy. So together we have um, a, a squad that can tackle a lot of different challenges that are um, put forth by our stakeholder partners. So when we say NASA data, what we mean really is any of the NASA tools and uh, resources that are available. These include um, portals like Worldview and Giovanni. It includes um, uh, aircraft campaigns like the Discovery Q data uh, models, but the backbone of this type of um, resource are the satellite data. And there's lots of different satellites up in space that are monitoring metrics pertinent to air quality and public health. Um, and there are more being launched uh, all the time. In fact, just today was the launch of the GEMS mission by uh, South Korea. And uh, while that's not a NASA product per se, it is part of this global constellation. And our team is encouraged to use any of these space-based products that are useful to stakeholders. So one of the things that we've found over the years really works is this team structure to science. It's not appropriate for every scientific project and it has a lot of uh, uh, unique characteristics, but for making uh, science as accessible as possible to a audience, we found the team really has some advantages. And HACAST was formed in 2016, and it really built on the success of its predecessor, ACAST. ACAST ran from 2011 to 2016 as a five-year initiative led by Daniel Jacob out of Harvard. And that had 19 members and a focus really on U.S. air quality management. With HACAST, the team size has shrunk a little bit to 13, uh, but our mission has gotten bigger to explicitly integrate public health as well as air quality stakeholders. And one of the things we've been in talking with NASA about since the very formation of our team was this question of what makes 13 funded grants through a team different than 13 funded grants in a traditional framework. 
And what we found is that, that having the team structure increases the visibility of the work and the resources to different end users. It would be very difficult for um, a professional at a state air quality agency or a public health organization to figure out of all the hundreds of scientists who are working on satellite data, who is the right person to call for a question. But having the collective with meetings and a website and a newsletter, it provides kind of a front door for organizations to connect with NASA resources. And for many questions, somebody in HACAST or one of our 70 co-investigators may be able to answer a question, but we certainly then would be able to help move the stakeholders uh, question in the right direction, whether it's connecting with training programs like the NASA Applied Remote Sensing Education and Training Program, RSET, or with other researchers um, in the U.S. or around the world. Also, a team uh, can build a culture to support and promote collaborations and uh, synergies. We found that there's oftentimes uh, these, you know, real-world problems don't always fit into one particular discipline or into the research program of a single investigator. But when you bring two or three or five different investigators together, they may have the expertise to tackle something that no single person would have been able to address. And most real world problems cut across issues and cut across tools. And so we found that having a team allows um, collaborative work to address real world problems more effectively. Um, because we have a lot of um, communication infrastructure uh, from these webinars to our website to our meetings, um, we have the capacity to build two-way dialogue, um, listening to stakeholders, integrating their priorities in our planning of our activities, and um, getting uh, our results and plans disseminated in a way that they can respond to. And this two-way dialogue actually has um, uh, is it takes a lot of time and effort to make it work, and uh, the team structure allows that, that effort to be spread across multiple different investigators. Um, the collaborations I mentioned about meeting stakeholder needs. Another thing is, since we've been meeting every six months uh, for the past three and a half years, we've seen that there's certain threads of research that really hold a lot of potential to meet stakeholder needs or to advance the science. And so oftentimes a concern would be raised by an attendee at a meeting in January, and then we might have results on that very question by our next meeting in July. And having this regular exchange within the team and within the broader uh, community of organizations working and interested in our work and um, the broader scientific community has, I think, helped certain threads of research move very fast um, in a way that um, addresses the concerns of some of our partners in air quality and health. So some of our major accomplishments, um, what you see here are two um, photos from uh, our meeting. Uh, Dr. Paul Miller, from who's the Executive Director of the Northeast States for Coordinated Air Use Management, NESCOM, and Minghui Dao, who's um, one of our uh, HACAST members. And over the course of HACAST, we've had a consistent increase in publications, in the number of stakeholders that are engaged, whether attending our meetings or subscribing to our newsletters, um, the, ha how happy people are with our meetings, how many people are coming. We've been able to track these different metrics and they're going up. And I'll draw your attention to the plot in the lower right-hand corner. Uh, this is a little bit dated and I'll tell you why I kept it in nonetheless. Um, this is the publications that HACAST had in 2016, where we were only half a year and just getting started, 2017 and 2018. What we found is that um, we're updating uh, these publications for 2019 and 2020, but that actually it's, get, it's a little tricky to count what actually um, counts as a HACAST publication, because there's so much synergistic activity happening, happening across the team that there are papers being written that may not be something that was proposed in the original proposal and may not come out of a formal part of a funded activity, but clearly trace back to an idea or a collaboration or a partnership that HACAST launched. 
So what we've been doing is actually going through the publications of all of our PIs and identifying ones that we think should count or might count as a HACAST publication. Um, and so what you see here on this graph, these are the uh, publications that the PIs self-reported as being HACAST publications. But when we were going through their um, publication record, we would see collaborations coming up amongst our um, team that hadn't been reported. And then we'd say, but did this start because of HACAST? And sometimes we'd go, oh yeah, that also started because of the team. So actually at this point, what we're looking at are publication numbers that look approximately double what um, was initially reported, which I think speaks to the ripple effect that HACAST is having. That a, P, that a researcher may uh, have been funded initially by HACAST, but then some of the work and suggestions and partnerships that came out of our team activities have led to other grants and other collaborations and kind of a, a ripple effect through their own work and the work that's coming out in, in the publication record. So we've been um, doing our best to try to capture that full effect without, of course, overcounting any of the publications. We don't want to claim credit if credit is not due. So what we're, at this point, we're going back and forth with our researchers to see how our um, how we can fully account for their HACAST publication impact. Beyond publications, we have these um, team meetings, we have these webinars, we have a number of different successes, which I'll mention on the next slide. We have lots of collaborations and we're engaged with other NASA activities. And as one example, um, Dagan Miller, who is the um, communications director for HACAST, regularly attends the Office of Communication meetings um, at NASA to make sure that we understand what kind of stories would be compelling and that then they know what the work that's coming out of our group. So there's a few um, examples of work that I think speak to the uh, benefits of this kind of applied science team, and I'll give more examples as I move through the talk. Um, one is on the upper left that's mentioning um, Arlene Fiore at Columbia University. In her initial proposal to HACAST, she was working with the New York State Department of Health and other health organizations around New York to characterize how air pollution was uh, changing in the state and how those changes were affecting public health. So I think you know, she just had a paper come out recently with those results, but that was a good example of something that she put in the proposal and um, was applied science research and is now um, seeing the results in a compelling way. Another example is um, the HACAST uh, has been building connections with the Environmental Protection Agency, and that goes back to the Air Quality Applied Sciences team as well. And so we've been thrilled that in 2016 and in 2018, satellite data was included in the EPA State of the Air report for the first time. And really for this, Brian Duncan gets the credit um, Brian's at NASA. And this has really, I think, been one of many threads of connection between NASA and EPA that have evolved over the past few years. And we're looking forward to having a meeting at EPA, uh, at the EPA Air Office in June to further explore how um, NASA and EPA could connect around air quality. As a third example of some of the work coming out of the team, is a paper that was uh, published uh, at the end of last year in the Journal of Air and Waste Management led by Ming-Wei Dao. Um, it's uh, at, the at the screenshot on the slide and most of those uh, co-authors, not all, but most uh, are from HACAST. And this paper was really trying to address a question we got over and over, which is how good are satellite data for deriving ground-based PM 2.5? And this is a really great question that doesn't have an easy answer. So we wanted to write a paper that laid out what we know, what we don't know, and kind of provided a background for organizations that were thinking about using PM 2.5 data and wanted to know what was the state of the science. So this came out of a TIGER team and really was a paper written in direct response to questions we'd heard during our meeting. So in addition to something that worked being the team structure, another thing that we found works is meeting users where they are. And I mean this on a few different levels. 
Uh, one uh, is that when I started with the ACAS team in 2011, and I think this is typical of many of us who are really excited about NASA data, there's this feeling that when an organization hears about really cool data, they'll start using it. And if you build it, they will come. But what we found over the years is that that is not how this process works. Um, you know, there's sort of five stages, so to speak, of uh, engagement with NASA data. And I would say the first is making, a new organi making an organization aware of what data sets are out there that could be useful to them. But oftentimes these organizations may be initially skeptical. Is this really, you know, helpful? It's only available once a day. It's not giving me surface PM 2.5. You know, I think that the a very common initial response is to be dubious on whether this is an appropriate use of the time and resources of their organization. Um, and sometimes it's not. And if it's not a good use of time, then it's good to be upfront about what the limitations of the data are. But in many cases, even though the data may not be perfect for what they want, it could, the data can help them move the, their conversation and their work further. And this is where there begins to be curiosity, maybe interest in exploring uh, uh, an application or a case study. And if things continue to move in a positive direction in a way that works with that organization's priorities, then the NASA data may end up being utilized in an operational context. But I think being aware of um, the barriers that different organizations have, including that they're already doing a job that probably doesn't use NASA data yet, um, there are other uh, issues as well. And just recognizing that an organization going from not knowing that the data exists to being made aware of it is already moving the needle. And if an organization is curious, maybe that's somebody that would be good to collaborate with on a project. And if an organization is already utilizing the data, then they would be a great person to come and speak at our meeting to show how a non-research, non-NASA organization is benefiting from these tools. Um, another way to meet uh, stakeholders where they are is to think about what data they're already using and how remote sensing can fit into that framework. And I really like, um, this is an adaptation of a slide that I took from my, one of my colleagues uh, Bart Sponseller, who at the time was the director of air monitoring for the state of Wisconsin. And he had these five roles that um, monitoring sites served. And the number one was um, compliance with the federal air quality standards. But the other four um, were looking at trends, comparing air quality and population or land use, evaluating atmospheric dispersion models, and um, getting information to the public. And I think thinking about how an organization like a state agency is already using monitoring data helps to build understanding on both sides about how they might use satellite data. And while satellite data are not currently appropriate for determining compliance with federal air standards, they've been definitely shown to be useful for looking at trends, evaluating models, comparing land use and transportation with air quality, and um, they're actually very well suited for air quality communication with the public. The compelling uh, maps and images and just the idea that you can see these chemicals from outer space, I think is very uh, evocative uh, with a lot of the audiences that I've spoken with. Um, then there's just sort of some practical issues about meeting users where they are. We have moved our meetings around the country. Our very first was in uh, Georgia, hosted by Emory University, then in Seattle, hosted by the University of Washington, in New York, hosted by Columbia, um, here in Madison, Wisconsin, um, hosted uh, by UW-Madison. Then we were hosted by Arizona State University uh, uh, for our fifth meeting, then uh, in Pasadena near the Jet Propulsion Lab for our sixth meeting. Our next meeting and our final meeting will be a showcase at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C., HACAST 7. Um, but we also have, of course, these webinars that are going on now that are taking place in the cloud, so I didn't know where to put them on a map. Um, but this idea that we're trying to move our meetings around to reach different audiences and stakeholder groups. Um, we, uh, for the past few meetings, have benefited from funding from NASA to fly in stakeholders, um, 
to these different meetings to broaden the geographic reach and the organizations that we can serve. We have been streaming all of our meetings, um, the technology for the streaming. We've been testing different things, so um, trying to fine tune what works the best. Um, these webinars, and actually a lot of our activities, uh, the Tiger teams and the individual projects use phone meetings to host regular interactions with their stakeholder partners. There's also these broader issues about understanding the priorities of an organization and that, you know, just doing research for the sake of research is not usually a priority of most health and air quality uh, groups. Um, that air quality can be very political and litigious, and so being sensitive to the context where different organizations are working. We like to ask a lot of questions to understand where um, organizations could benefit most from NASA tools and data. And being aware that uh, the data formats that are typical in the research community, like the NetCDF or HDF formats, are not typical with a lot of user groups. And so thinking about what is the format, maybe it's a time series that they could plot in Excel or um, shape files for GIS, but trying to be aware that there are sometimes um, small technical barriers that can be adjusted. Um, and this is also a good place for me to say that, you know, we've been trying to listen and adapt our activities as much as possible to meet the needs of our audience. And one example is that we were asked with these webinars whether we could provide certificates of completion to show um, ongoing professional uh, education for organizations where that is a priority. And we hadn't thought of it. But as soon as we were asked the question, we knew we could easily do it. So if you would benefit from having a certificate of completion, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or to um, Paige or Dagan to uh, request your certificate. Um, we've uh, some a few more examples of the kind of work that has come out of this uh, enterprise. Um, at the bottom, you see the uh, tutorial for NASA Worldview. Uh, we were asked uh, a number of times if we could provide help on how to use some of the tools that were out there intended for broader dissemination. So we developed um, tutorials for NASA Worldview and NASA Giovanni. Um, there's been a lot of interest in how satellite data can support better emission inventories. And Mark Zonlow's work has been moving forward um, around uh, agricultural emissions. Davin Hinsey is also working on ammonia emissions from agriculture and trying to see how satellite data can support this clear need where, um, and, and working with air quality managers to make sure that, that data, those data are out there. And Daniel Tong at uh, George Mason University has been doing a lot on dust storms. And we, you know, there's a lot of news items on our HACAS website about all of these folks. But, you know, I put this one here to make the point that he was being interviewed in Sierra Magazine. And one thing that's been very rewarding to me about working on this project is knowing that our NASA program managers are interested in how we are getting the word out through professional magazines and public venues, as well as peer-reviewed publications. So it's not either or, uh, but trying again to meet the audience and different audiences in different places. Um, another thing that's been working of our team has been this idea of these tiger teams. Um, this is the term NASA uses for uh, short-term, high-impact projects, and in our case, they were collaborations that came out from the team after the team was already together, and there, were, uh, there was additional funding uh, allocated to these teams. Um, over the, we've had eight Tiger teams. They're all listed on our website um, under the different tabs from 2017 and 2018. And we really had to think about what is the right way to be structuring these Tiger teams. And I'll say that through the ACAST team, there was a lot of experimentation for different models. And toward the end of ACAST, we came up with a model that worked pretty well. And that has been what we've been moving with through the HACAST activity. And basically the idea is that we have these funded groups, these 13 PI-led teams, and we want them all to be engaged in a collaborative structure. Um, but we also want to have comp competition, uh, one, because that's how NASA funds projects, and two, um, just because we want to make sure that the best ideas are bubbling to the top. 
But sometimes collaboration and competition can be at odds with each other. And that's especially true if you have um, a competition for resources, because then having a smaller team actually um, gives everybody a bigger piece of the pie. And we didn't want that. We wanted um, the we wanted the incentive to be to make a bigger team. So uh, we started with the assumption that all of the 13 PIs would be involved, resources would be allocated to those teams, uh, to those investigators. And then the question is, what are the projects that most benefit from the expertise of the team and best serve the needs of air quality and health organizations? So we um, uh, we had, uh, in each round, short proposals developed by our PIs based on what they've heard and their own uh, knowledge of um, air quality and health organization needs. Then these short proposals were reviewed by uh, practitioners in health and air quality, sort of the stakeholders that we're trying to reach. And based on their reviews, then the funding was allocated. So over time, we've had the proposed initiatives that the KCAST uh, investigators wrote in their proposal moving forward. And we've also had two rounds of competitive Tiger team selection. Uh, each was supposed to last one year. And then uh, when our team was renewed for an additional year, uh, I reached out to all of the leads of the Tiger teams to say, you know, if you could have one more year of funding, what would you do with it? And um, luckily, we were able to meet almost all of the requests for uh, continuing work. In some cases, the project was, was done and there was no continuing work. But in other cases, it was a great opportunity to double down on the successes. I'm going to skip over um, some of these, so I want to have plenty of time for uh, questions. Um, uh, but I want to make sure to get to talking about our meeting structure, because we really over time came up with an unusual um, meeting structure that was intended to build as much back and forth dialogue as possible. And these photos were from this summer in Pasadena. And the framework that we uh, adopted was to make the default talk time five minutes, a five minute talk uh, to really just get at the essential nature of what is the problem, what is the resource, what is the finding. And when we first proposed this, I was a little worried that um, people wouldn't like it or wouldn't work, and so we kind of rolled it out slowly. But in time, actually, the five-minute talks were very popular, both by the scientists and by the stakeholders. And keeping these short talks allowed us to allocate a lot of time for question and answer. So a third of all meeting time was Q&A. We did have a few 15-minute uh, talks. Those are our long talks, um, but that was the minority uh, of talks. This also allowed lots of time for networking, and it was a really good format to put the scientist presentations and the stakeholder presentations on an equal playing field, because a lot of scientists are very used to talking and talking in detail about their work, um, but not so many of the stakeholder partners didn't have that as much a part of their job description. So having shorter talks just put us all in a way that we could present what we were doing and what our needs were and what our ideas were, and then sit together on a panel for a question and answer. Um, over time, we were thrilled to have a higher and higher percentage of uh, stakeholders attending our meeting. And what you see, uh, the Haycast 4, 5, and 6, those were the more recent meetings where NASA funding was available for stakeholders to attend. And over those three meetings, the percentage of uh, stakeholder attendees uh, increased from about 34% to 44% at our most recent meeting. Um, prior to that, we also had a good turnout uh, of stakeholders, especially at Haycast 3 in New York, but um, that was in part because the location in New York was nearby a lot of air quality management organizations in nearby states who could drive in. After every um, meeting, we would survey attendees to ask them what they liked and what they wanted changed, and we were especially interested in how we were allocating our time. And this is typical of the kind of results we got across our meetings, where we um, asked about the five-minute talks, about the 15-minute talks, about Q&A, networking time, talks by scientists, talks by stakeholders. And um, most responses for most categories said that we spent the right amount of time. So most people were happy. Um, in every category, there were some people who wanted more time spent. 
And we felt like they were happy too because they wanted more, more of whatever it was that we were offering. So those are the light green categories. The only things that people didn't like are labeled in the red. And as you can see, it's, nobody thought we had too many of the short talks. And the thing that got the biggest ding were those long talks. So even though we don't, 15 minutes is not that long, and we had very few 15-minute talks, but even then, the audience was pushing for more and more of the short talks. Um, but I think overall, we started moving in a direction that certainly allowed a lot of personal connections to be made and heavy on the Q&A, which seemed to be popular. So I've been talking about the things that worked, um, uh, but there have also been some things that uh, that didn't work as well. And um, and just to um, you know, kind of set the the stage for those, I think one is expecting partners to embrace the unknown. Um, this idea that it, that an organization would show up at a meeting and then leave the meeting ready to start using NASA data is just unrealistic. Our goal was really to build excitement to find easy opportunities to connect, and then invite deeper engagement, whether it was attending a meeting or collaborating on a Tiger team or being part of a monthly teleconference, trying to build as many different ways to plug in as possible. Another thing that didn't work but that well is presenting research for research's sake. You know, we have a lot of experienced scientists involved in HACAST, and we all have a lot of exciting ideas to share. But keeping the focus on the mission of the team, which was to connect with air quality and health organizations. So not using the time together to go in depth about the latest algorithm that we developed, but instead to really focus on um, what does this mean to um, different audiences, uh, the issues that they care about, and trying to minimize uh, jargon. And I think the last thing that we found didn't work that well was cold calling partners. There, there's a, a major relationship human side to this process, and we really wanted to work on building relationships through different kinds of meetings on the phone, in person, and one-on-one. -on -one. And I think once you have a series of, of, of conversations about what the organization's needs are, where NASA data could help, that was really the, first, the, the starting point for a collaboration. The... Um, um, so, and I'll say, I'll just end with this slide here, which is um, our website again, um, but also sort of pointing you toward these tools and resources that um, uh, are a good place to get started if this is uh, new to you or someplace to point stakeholders that you know who might be interested in using NASA data. Um, but I'll say none of this would have been possible without the amazing work of our communications team. Um, you all have gotten lots of emails and you see Paige's smiling face on your um, video now. Um, he's our digital media director, and Dagan Miller has been um, fundamental to shaping this project since the start. So I just want to have a shout out to Dagan and Paige, but also in terms of what works and what doesn't, none of this really would be possible without a pretty big investment in communications and having great people. So with that, I'll end and take questions. <laughs>